What's up and welcome to another episode of the Scott and Ian show on the SBL podcast. And today we're making that list. Oh, we're making lists. We're making lists. We're talking about the five bases every bassist needs. It's a really fun conversation. Now, now look, you could argue that you really only need one. Could you get by with just one? Of course. Like old Bob Allison used to say, Ian, don't they kind of always go boom, boom, boom? You're not wrong, Dad. You're not wrong, but that's no fun. We want to talk about all the options. I remember seeing, as a kid, a Bass Player Magazine episode that came out that said, like, here are the bases that everybody needs. So we're sort of doing an update on that. It's interesting. I come at it from sort of a studio perspective, thinking about tracking on somebody's record. Scott's maybe coming at it from a live or gigging perspective. Where do you come at it from? How, how many bases do you bring to a session? right? How many bases do you bring on stage? Do you always bring a backup for a gig? What about a tour? What about a jam session? We're going to talk about some of this stuff. And I absolutely love talking about this. Of course, you can get it done on one, but that's no fun. We're going to talk about all the bases you need. Okay. Hey, this week at SBL, there's some really cool stuff going on. I got to tell you about it before we get into the episode. We just released last week uh, a songwriting and composition course with Michael League. If you don't know Michael League, he is the leader founder bass player of snarky puppy and whenever he does content it's incredible it's musical it's not just super bass nerd focused it's very wide it's very music and musician focused anybody can get a lot out of it check out that course that's on sbl also we've got a mentor session coming up we live stream every monday with a whole host of different educators and mine is coming up you guys i do the a to z of the greatest bass lines we are on j if you don't think we're not, if, if, if you don't think we're going to do some Jocko, you're wrong. We're going to do some Jocko. You don't think we're going to do some Jamiroquai, maybe some virtual insanity. Well, you'd be wrong. We are going to do some Jamiroquai, probably some Jocko and Jamiroquai coming up for Jay. That's so fun. I love getting to do that for SBL. We also have the fretboard accelerator program. It's going to close this Friday, March 17th. If you haven't taken it before and you're wondering, you're like, ah, I just need to sort of dig in and learn my fretboard once and for all, check that out. It's an excellent resource for doing that. And look, if you don't know what we do at SBL, I would encourage you take the free 14 day trial, see what it's all about. I'll see you on the inside. And now that's enough of me. Let's get to this conversation about the five bases you need. Who did raw hide? <laughs> raw hide. I have no idea. I have no idea. That's an awesome dude. Tune. <laughs> <laughs> we should go wild on YouTube, and that, that should be our next YouTube video: how to play raw hide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody we love do, that. Like, tut- yeah, we should do tutorials of of songs that <laughs> nobody wants to. Learn. Oh, dude, you are out, man! <laughs> just like the the best way to just tank here, <laughs> just just the yeah. most like gnarly self sabotage, <laughs> just <Yeah>. like. <laughs> <laughs> tutorials on stuff nobody nobody wants nobody wants it's <laughs> amazing yeah. how to triple uh. thumb pluck <laughs> like, what what i thought it was double thumb well now you can triple thumb <laughs> dude oh you're word. on you're, you're on some painkillers <laughs> i am i just want to apologize to everybody right now that i'm so like if you're watching the video it's gonna look like i'm kind of like laying back <laughs> Because I, I am laying back on my chair because I've uh, done something to my back. And as Ian said, I've been hammering the painkillers over the last day. And that's uh, that's been fun. But uh, yeah, and if you're wondering how I did my back in, well, my <laughs> wife poured herself a bath. Beautiful bath, and she and she said, "Oh, it's full of the bath salts that are soothing and great for the muscles and shit like that." I was like, "Great." <laughs> Go, go for it, Lisa. Anyway, so life got in the way. She's lying in bed. I was like, oh, you're not getting in the bath. She was like, I've run out of time. I was like, oh, can I get in the bath? <laughs> oh, my she God. Was I like, didn't know that was the deal. Yeah, this is yeah, the deal. Okay. Yeah, I was, yeah. Like, I was like, I'll get in the bath. She was like, yeah, go for it. Right? I was like, All of these bath salts and stuff like oh, that. Of course, this you don't want to waste that. A, this is going to be a soothing experience. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> so I got in, my, got in the bath, and I have like maybe one bath or two baths a year because I'm a bit of a shower guy. So I get in the bath, and I'm like, oh, 
this is a pretty weird small bath. And, and you know, the salts were, t you know, they were doing their thing. And I was like, oh, I really want to relax and put my head back. But where our bath is, there's nothing to put your head against. So it was kind of like some a big lanky thing in this bath, and nothing to put my head on. Amazing. So I kind of like scooched my body under the water, le leaned my head against the back of the bath, and obviously my legs are freaking stupid and long. So <laughs> so I kind of stuck them out. Yeah, just like, yeah, you just did. Like, yeah, just stuck them out of the bath. Yeah, and then I fell asleep oh, in the buddy. bath. And woke up about like 20 minutes, 30 minutes afterwards. And, and I was like, oh, that's a weird position to fall asleep in. Got out of the bath. Everything was fine. Uh huh. Went to bed, woke up. And I just, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the realization, I was like, I feel a bit weird. And then I moved yeah. and I was like, oh. Uh, oh, yeah. The, the, the pain that seizes you. Yeah. Yes. So I've, I've done something to my low back in the bath. It's, uh, it was the bath salts. It was the bath salts. <laughs> it was the salts fault. <laughs> it was the salts fault. <laughs> oh, supposed to be so soothing. I remember seeing this thing with uh, Blink-182 where Mark Hoppus, you know, had a thing where like he's sitting in a studio, like very astute and upright in a chair that has like a, you know, like a big back. And, and the yeah. caption was something like this back support or something like, you know, this chair is perfect for supporting my adult back. <laughs> and I just laughed. That's it. My I've adult, adult back. back going. Yeah. Adult back means bad back. Yeah. yeah Doodle, I'm dude. sorry. Glad you're Anyone, here. Yeah, me too. Me too. Like we, we had serious uh we were supposed to be doing a uh, an interview before this, but um uh, but the the guy uh, couldn't couldn't get on with us. Uh, but uh, just before we did, we were going to do the interview. I was like, I think I might have to bail <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know whether I'm going to be able to be able to sit here for so long. But it's been okay, actually. I've done, Incredible! Yeah. You're a soldier. I am. I am. <laughs> Cut to tomorrow. I won't be able to move. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I know that you guys don't have like the heavy painkillers. You can't just get um, oxycotton no. and Vicodin and stuff like we can in the states. I mean, no. man, you know, yeah, you got to you got to get a prescription for ibuprofen. I did yeah. not know that. Yeah. I well, you could you could get ibuprofen from the chemist, but if you want to get like any serious amount of it, you've got to get a. You've got to go to the doctors. You're telling me you can't just yeah. go to Costco and get the bulk, like two, <laughs> you know, like the two just giant jugs of like a thousand <laughs> pills of ibuprofen. No. You're telling me, you're telling me that that's maybe an unhealthy characteristic of the United <laughs> States, just self-medicating, just like the most terrible, you know, like health system. We're just like, ah, take care of it yourself. Go to Costco and get a bottle of pills. That's it's, what we it's, do. It's legit, isn't it? It's got like there's a serious kind of like painkiller issue in the states, isn't there? Oh yes. Oh or yes, is that like there an is. Understatement. <laughs> yeah, there is, man. I mean, you know, and w when Emily was struggling with her back, I mean, my wife just had back surgery recently, but she did not want to. She could have gotten a script for you know heavy narcotic painkillers, yeah. and she didn't want to do it because she just thought, man, once you get on that stuff, it's hard. Like if you're dealing with chronic pain. Yeah, man, yeah. it's hard to get off. Yeah. So she she opted for a surgery instead. But um, man, like, yeah, I I do know some people who you know you get on that painkiller and then <clears throat> if your condition stays the same, you kind of just need that painkiller. Yeah, because right, yeah, not great. Because isn't it? Not great. Yeah, yeah, dude. <clears throat> what are we yeah. talking about today? We got we got bases, man. Listen, we got five bases that everybody needs. Five bases that everybody needs. Now, some could argue you really only need one, that you you could get by with two. A guy like me would argue that you need 40. <laughs> but you're settling with five. We're settling with five. And, <laughs> and I wonder, too, about, like, the environment. When I started to write my list of my five, you know, the five you need, I was yeah. thinking more about a studio environment. Like, I was tacking on to the title, Five Bases Everybody Needs in the Studio. But oh, that's not yeah. what this is. This is a this is a free for all, Scott. This is an all skate. <laughs> We're dealers. <laughs> we deal out I of mean, base drugs. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder for you and for me, what are the five that just immediately come up? And I wonder if uh, if you have a prescription. Oh, speaking of yeah. speaking of scripts, yeah, if you've got a prescription scripts, yeah. for the people people out there. 
First um, one that jumped to mind for me. Yeah. Well, the first thing actually is kind of like what you alluded to there as well. I was like, who needs five bases? Because yeah. I think that the hell there are there there are like studio musicians that actually legit need to have sort of like a a, a set of bases to do different things because they're called to do different things and right um but also just to you bit of bass junkies out there you know get some more bases here's five <laughs> but yeah so my <laughs> my first yeah was the jazz bass <clears throat> amazing that's that your my first, first one that was that's my the first, first one that you wrote down jazz bass. first one i've actually got the list right in front of me the the jazz bass um why i've got no particular reason i don't think oh actually it was just the first thing to pop to pop to mind for me but if i actually had to put a bit of substance behind it i would say because you can get it is a it's a workhorse right it's a workhorse mm -hmm. bass it is a classic bass sound that you yes, should be able to you know depend on what situation you're working within that you that you would want to be able to recreate right so it's a classic bass sound there are definitely uh records that say you're in sort of like a you know a corporate band or a function band or something like that some of them records just sound like them tracks just sound better with a jazz bass on them i know because they mean. were recorded with a jazz bass yeah you know so yeah it's like a classic sound through of like of bass through history it, they're also really versatile you've got the bridge sound you've got the neck pickup sound you've got the combination of the sounds of the two pickups they've got a great slap tone as well um and yeah and just a great workhorse yeah it's yes, it's like the greatest first on the list well can i tell you something before we move on to the second on your list when i made my list i was thinking about the studio and a jazz bass didn't make my list no which is way. preposterous because it's my favorite bass but i was wow. sort of thinking dude i've had this strange thing in the studio where when I am going to play on somebody else's material and maybe it's, uh, it's not aggressive rock and roll or it's not <clears throat> pop, or maybe it's like sort of singer songwriter. I always find that like a P bass or something hollow body or something is like leans into that thing and yeah. I'll bring a jazz bass and I never use it. And I hate it because I love the jazz bass. It's like my favorite thing. But I always find that when I bring it into the studio, I if I have another option, I almost always use that other option. Why so is the, that? I, I think there's something. I mean, obviously, so for me, my first one is going to be P bass. And it's funny, man, because I don't play a P bass that often. But yeah. in the studio, it sits in a way and takes up so much space that it's undeniable like I just played on something recently of a friend of mine, Jeremy Messer Smith with just this like simple line kind of Motowny vibes. Yeah. And I tried a bunch of things and then I was like, okay, P bass with flats, uh, duh. It's like the obvious choice. And it was so obvious, the mid range, yeah. the chewiness, how it sits, how it takes up space in a track. I was just like, Oh, it's undeniable. And I, and I hate that. Because I love a jazz bass. But so, so look, yeah, jazz bass, of course, yes. Yeah. But for a recording list, if you're thinking about recording, Ooh. I think a P bass is a better choice for all around. Like if you're like, oh, I have some instruments and, you know, and I'm recording a lot, what should I get? And you don't have a P bass absolutely you should get one but i love your your take scott of like if you're in a corporate band or you're you're doing a wide variety of things you need something to kind of cut through on a stage yeah, yeah. jazz bass without a doubt yeah yeah like it, like if even if, if somebody was like starting out right or they've been playing for sort of like six months a year and they're like hey i want to upgrade yeah you know, what kind of what kind of bass should i get I would probably edge towards you should get something like a jazz bass, yeah, or for sure. something with that pickup setup, because yes. because you're just kind of like getting into so many different things, and I think that if you oh, at that stage of your playing, if you only had a precision bass, there are certain things that you you're going to want to try out that might not sound how you want them to sound. Agreed, right? I would agree so with for that. instance, you're like you you're getting into slap. 
and you're like, oh, I want to try this slap thing out. Well, slap on P basses is cool for yep. sure, but yep. it ain't going to sound exactly like you probably want it to sound like Marcus right. Miller or or Flea or somebody right. like that, where you could get a pretty, you know, a pretty good kind of representation of a P bass tone using the neck pickup of a jazz bass. So, yes. you know, that's probably why I'd say jazz. But okay, so you, you've got precision for your number one. I've got jazz bass. What was your number two? another precision <laughs> no way with yeah. rounds yeah so i Ooh. think i think you got it i think you know and again Double i was precision. yeah i was <laughs> aiming for studio so this is kind of fun like i like it yeah, like you cool, you're, yeah. you've made a list that's aiming for all around maybe or like maybe like live yeah um or all around and i was really when i made this list i was really thinking about what i do on sessions or in the studio yeah. and uh yeah, I would say a P with rounds and a P with flats. Yeah. Boy, I'll back oh that up boy. as well. Like conversations with John Button and Sean Hurley are exactly the same. Like I've sat with them and looked at, you know, their bass collection in the studio. Or maybe I haven't been in the studio with John, but I've certainly spoken to him about it. But I've been in the studio with Sean and seen yeah. that he's got like, he's always got his flat, his P bass with flats, and yep. he's always got a P bass with rounds as well. Yep. So, yeah. Cool. And there's something Double about precision. like that P bass with rounds can kind of do anything in the studio. Like you can play rock with a pick. It can't, you yeah. know, roll the tone back a little bit in fingers. And it's really, I think if I had to just choose one of those two, it would be a P with rounds actually. Cause I think that will be more versatile, wow. but okay. a P with flats just is this undeniable classic sound. So if anything is leaning into like smooth ballad, um, or like R and B kind of like old school funk, like it just conjures a vibe, like a P yeah. with flats just sounds like so many classic records from the sixties and seventies that when you play it, it's like, Oh, everybody's like, Oh yeah, that's that thing. And yeah, that's a yeah. fun thing to have in the studio. But, but what do you say? What's your second? Precision. In, over, yeah. Yeah. Precision. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't, um, I haven't, I, on my notes down here, I'm looking at my notes. I haven't sort of like signified whether it'd be flats or rounds. Yeah. So you, you guys make up your mind. But um, yeah, I've got jazz and then precision. Yeah. Oh, I wish it wasn't so obvious. <laughs> I know. I know. It's like, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know. Um, I hear you. Yeah. Like it, it is sort of, it is sort of this obvious list, but I might, I might throw something at you that, uh, that's going to freak you out near the I'll end. I'll have some curveballs. <laughs> okay, all right. A couple of curveballs coming. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. it's like, duh, like one and two, a jazz bass and a P bass. Okay, <laughs> third one for me is a pretty kind of like, duh. It's another one of those, right? Okay, I'm ready. Modern five string. Yeah. Modern active five string. Interesting. Yes, why? Um. Okay, so especially if you are doing like corporate gigs or something like that, or working in the studio. Like if you are like some, like I'm in this situation right now, actually where I'm playing, a, I'm, I'm working on a project and like the parts have been written for a five string, Yes, <laughs> you know? Right. So I just haven't got any choice. It's like, Oh, it's a five string. Um, and I've been in a situation before as well, where I only had a four string, they wanted a five, or the, the parts were written for five string, and it was just a big old ball ache trying to transpose. <laughs> uh, yeah. It didn't sound right. And right. Then now I'm, I'm dropping the D. Yes. I was like, oh. Tuning down. Uh, yeah, all of that yep. thing. And like, don't get me wrong, like, people can do it, and, you know, like, more power to them. That's great. But for me, yeah, I really like to have a modern five string. And, yeah. and preferably an active, just in case like I want that active sound on a track. And then I've got two things in one. I've got that modern active sound and I've got a five string as well. What do you think is like, why not a passive five? Like for you, because I, I agree with you, but I just want to hear your take on like, why should it in your mind be an active five string? Yeah, it shouldn't necessarily be. The reason why I wanted to get a modern active five string is to kill two birds with one stone in this yeah. scenario, just so I can get like a, because active basses do sound differently as well. Right. You know, just, just the nature of the beast. Um, and, and I only had five slots, dude. I only <laughs> had five slots. I had to slot two of them together. Yeah. So they yeah, modern active five string. So something like, uh, MTD yeah. or F bass yep. or, what we were talking about just earlier, Ken Smith, right? Yeah. Which is kind of, 
yeah, if you want to go sort of like really full on, like, you know, uh, actually just to, the MTD and the Ken Smith, of those three bases I just mentioned, the F bass is actually very Fendery sounding. Yes, so, right, right. Yeah, so that might not be if you were going for a very active sounding bass, whereas the, the MTD and the... Uh, the Ken Smith, Ken Smith yeah. are very active sounding in, in completely different ways. Actually, the MTD, in my experience, super. It's got a scoop sound to it. It has right. that kind of vibe to it. And the the Ken Smith for me kind of just sounds like a piano. <laughs> it sounds like an active piano. Yes, like yeah. so clear and all over the ranges. And yeah, uh, another one I'm going to throw in the mix and um, an active five string that I really love in a different zone is a Spectre. Um, oh yes, because yeah. they they have this like almost sort of like rock and roll edge to them, yeah. where they're like an aggressive sounding active five. You can still play them in a smooth context, but the stuff that I do, I think like I would lean more that direction because I'm very rarely called to play gospel music or like modern sort of R and B where you're going to need, like no one has ever said to me ever, can you bring that MTD vibe? <laughs> like no one has ever said those words <laughs> yeah, yeah, to yeah, me yeah, yeah, because yeah. that's just not like the, the vibes that I give off, right? More yeah. it's like, oh, it's going to be this hard rock project. And then I'm thinking maybe like Dingwall or Spectre, something in those, in that realm. Yeah, um, but yeah. I, I like this dude. I like this idea of like active modern five because when you're listening to songs or when you're going to play something, you need to ask yourself, like, what's the cloak? What's the right, uh, the costume? What's the right wrapping for yeah, yeah. this vibe, right? And sometimes, you know, a passive five is just sort of going to sound more like a passive four string, which might be uh -huh. great for that throwback tune you're doing. But man, for that modern thing, whether it's like a hard rock thing or like a fusion thing, gospel thing, the modern active five is a sound. It's like a thumbprint blueprint <gasps> sound. Yeah. 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 Like when, when you said like that gospel sound for me, yeah. there's so many players over recent years have played MTDs that yes. it just seems like that is part of the sound, right? Like absolutely. Andrew Goucher for Goucher. one, you know, I just like his, his, that sound is almost like it really just nails that gospel vibe that's so who, cool who jumps to mind for me and obviously like fred hammond as well on the smith like different yep. very different yeah like as we were just saying earlier like the mtd's got this real scooped sound yep the uh the, the ken smith on the other hand has got like this mid present that presence that will poke your eye out if you're not careful <laughs> yeah you know and, and i love it I, I it's really, really love, neat yeah yeah i love both uh both sounds i was talking earlier about i was um, playing some of the stuff off the uh, the album that I'm going to be uh, recording on in a few months' time. I've been experimenting with different bases for that, and nothing sounded as good on those tracks as the four string at uh, Ken Smith. I've actually been using the five string Willis bass as well, but the fretted basses that there was something about the. I'll tell you what. Actually, this is interesting. Yeah. the The fretless sounds great on all of the tracks. And fretless bass, for whatever reason, has a certain mid quality yes. about it, especially like that one that I'm using the Ibanez. And then I've pl played all of the other fretted basses I've got on the tracks. And the only one that really jumps out to me that really suits the track is that Ken Smith 4 that I've got. And when you listen to the mid of that, it's actually similar to the fretless. To the fretless. It's, that, it's got this uh, honk, honk, honk. Yeah, yeah, it's like really cut. So I think there's something very similar there which is why, yeah, the Ken Smith jumped out. But yeah, so is this, am I putting like third on your list? Is it a modern five? Is this it? Yeah, modern let's do five? it. I, I, yeah. I just put on my list a five string. I mean, that was actually fourth on my list. Ooh. Yeah, it was, it, it was, uh, I had, I had something different in the three slot, but I agree it is on my list. Okay. <laughs> but I'm I think moving it me, down to fourth spot. <laughs> fourth spot. Yeah. I'm moving and, and, you it know, down. What's I, third then on yours? Well, before we move on to third, I would just want to say this. I get people asking me a lot like, Hey, can you just do, can you replace a five string with an octave pedal? Can you buy an octave pedal and you know, step on that thing. If if you're playing a song that needs a B or a D or a C or whatever, like a low note, and you don't have it on your four, instead of tuning down, can you get it with an octave pedal? And I'm curious to hear what you have to say about this too. But for me, yes, you can do it. But for me, an octave pedal is like a sound. Like I only use octave pedal when I'm trying to sound like 
uh, key base. Like I'm never stepping yeah. on it momentarily yeah. just to get a low D yeah. um, when the track doesn't call for that sound because it's a very specific sound. So I like the idea of having an instrument that has five strings if I want to do, or six strings, I guess, because I have that Ken Smith six that yeah. is just so that modern active thing, which is probably the bass that I would bring if I was doing any kind of gospel vibe. Um, yeah. And then a, a Spectre probably for an aggressive modern five. Um, yeah. yeah, but I don't think you can use an octave pedal to do a, to do like a convincing five string thing personally. Yeah. It's, I think that you could, sonically you it, okay let me think about this it depends on the music i think so yes. yeah like this thing for instance that i've just been working on no way no way <laughs> you know because yeah. you're jumping around like you're playing up you're playing down there's like a bunch of there's just you're going onto that b string way too much and then suddenly you're on the g <laughs> string and then suddenly you get you back down to the b string yeah. it'll be crazy so in in those scenarios no if it was like more of a sort of like steady groove thing, I think that sonically you can do, uh, you can get in the territory yeah. of a B string using an octave, but it is not going to sound the same. Right. Um, yeah. It's just not going to sound the same because it isn't the same. It's, it's completely different. And I think that I'll tell you what, man, when I, I actually don't gravitate towards a five string at home, not naturally. I pick up like my four strings and play them and it's fine. Uh, but on a gig, like that, that, that B string is awesome. It is awesome. You're right. <laughs> that D. <laughs> it's just so great. And, well, and especially if you have a oh. good five string, right? I mean, yes. like, you know, your F bass, or I had that experience with the Spectre recently where I brought it out. It's a Spectre that no one is supposed to know exists yet, but I brought it out on a gig and played, um, played a D, D flat. Yeah. In that zone. And it's just like, I just wanted to be there all night. Oh, it's you know? so great, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it just fills so much room. It's just like, oh, it's, it's like a so warm awesome. blanket. I yeah. know, yeah. and it's cool if you like. For me, anyway, no one expects that from me. So you know, I, I play in like this variety band that does you know parties and weddings and stuff, and uh, you know, like getting with this drummer friend of mine, Zach Miller, and if I'm sparing with the B string, I can get him to look at me every time I play it because he's like, "What? Like, how did you just do that?" And he's so great at being like attuned to a change in the, you know, we're playing September or something. And just for a moment, boom, to boom, boom, like going from D, D flat, B, like, yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, getting, yeah, yeah, getting yeah. that low, you know, usually where it's the octave higher on the A string, but holy cow, just for a moment dropping that. And he was like, oh my God. So for me, it's like this fun, almost sort of like party trick <laughs> that, I, that I can do to make my drummer excited. And I, yeah, I got to tell you, yeah. man, it's pretty intoxicating. I yep. was, uh, yeah, there's a great track, actually. There's a, a YouTube channel, uh, this guy called Jason Cherry, and he's done this. Uh, it's a great video, and he's A, B, and A, Ken Smith, and a Federa back-to-back, -back, right? Yeah. Ken Smith is going, oh, yeah. Ken, have you seen the, have you, you seen it? You sent it to me. It's, it's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. he's, he's, he's playing uh, The Way by Jill Scott. That's it. Sorry, I forgot. So he's playing The Way by Jill Scott. And, and it just sounds so good on that so track. Cool. It's five string, you know. Well, he's actually playing the six. But that low B, I think there's a demonstration if you wanted to check out that track that Jason's playing. Shout out to Jason. Jason, I'm enjoying your videos, man. And, and your Ken Smith and Federis. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you listen to that track, you just couldn't do that. Or using an octave pedal. It's just not going to no. sound the same. Yeah, it would just sound kind of weird. It's and yeah, and idea. like for me, it's octave pedal is in the space of being a key bass player. It's the, you know, the great Michael League said, I only step on a pedal when it would be musically irresponsible not to do so. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, so exactly that. Yeah. You're trying to do the Stevie Wonder thing, or if you're trying to do like a modern electronica vibe, octave pedal is great. Um, but not like for just specific, like playing in the range of the instrument in like an R&B context, or at least not yet. Maybe, maybe there's somebody that's going to come out there and just do it, you know? There's and like some be... cool people that do like Thaddeus yeah. Tribbett, sort of like mm. he has done some cool stuff with octaves and stuff, like, but it doesn't sound like a five string. It sounds like it's own right. thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. It's own yeah. thing. A very cool thing. Yeah. But yeah, not a replacement for a five. I no, suppose. not a replacement. Yeah. yeah. So what's in, what's in your third spot then? My, in my third spot, this is stupid. I couldn't make a decision. So I put two things. And that's not fair. So I'm going to yeah, make dude. a decision right now. <laughs> I'm going to make that decision right now. I think in the third spot for me 
is a short scale hollow body bass. Now that is very specific. Yeah. But I'm going to say either Hoffner or Guild Starfire or Fender Coronado, something that is 30 inch scale yeah. and that is hollow. And then pick your strings. I don't know. Um, you get such a wild difference between flats or nylons or rounds. But I just have found that that instrument, not necessarily live. Again, remember, I'm maybe making the studio list here. That sound is so, it's everywhere on records. Um, in indie rock world, in kind of even like modern pop world, that instrument has all this character. It doesn't yeah. sound just like a, that's the instrument I reach for. So I have two that I use a ton. I have a 67 Hofner Club that is incredible. Every time I play it, I'm like, oh, why don't I just play this all the time? <laughs> it has very little sustain, but the notes just sound huge, like yeah. absolutely huge. And then I have a Guild Starfire from the 60s too that is just, so when you need that character, that plunkiness, that track filling amazing like high notes that still read as bass yeah. you play on the d string and the g string and the notes sound huge and they still sound like a bass versus playing the g string on a modern active five sounds pretty like piggy Thin. yeah piggy, yeah yeah, it's yeah. Completely, yeah it's, it's interesting those like i think jonathan maron's talked about that before that it, those those certain basses to use your language right there read as a bass all the way up you know, no matter yes. what the string you're on, it sounds like you bass. never lose that fundamental <laughs> yeah, yeah. kind of cushion to the to the tone. Whereas yep. on a modern active, when you go onto that that G string, it can sound guitar-y. Yeah, it, yeah, it sounds like a bit like a guitar. Yeah, yeah. You, you lose that bass vibe to it. And dude, shout out to Marin because I think I just stole his language. I mean, you you said like, oh, the language that you used is it reads like a bass. I think I just stole oh, that, that from Marin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, dude, <laughs> shout out to Marin. He has that amazing um, Kalamazoo, which was yes. like made by Gibson. It's a Kalamazoo short scale. It's a it's a uh, not a hollow body. It's you know just a short scale solid body instrument. Those are great too. I mean, like a Fender Mustang. I'm going to give a yeah. shout out to Saku Viore from Voren Saku makes all these incredible short skills. Sarek, Wilcock, yes, like the yes. Wilcock Malarkey. Those are all short scale, uh, That's really solid popular, bodies. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it's just, it's an incredible, again, another just thumbprint sound that is so cool, but I'm adding hollow body into the mix because I think that even takes it one step into, um, some more interest. I think it's yeah. incredible. Yeah, Have absolutely. you ever had a hollow body short string in your arsenal, Scott Devine? <sighs> because I don't think I don't you th have. I don't think I have actually. No, I, I think that. I think. I think that might need to be in your future. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> Stop it! Don't take anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm like more drugs. Hey, yeah, buddy, don't yeah. you need more drugs? <laughs> <laughs> Try a little taste of this. Oh, just for hey, context, pal. everybody, just before we, we started this call, I was talking about <laughs> how I should sell some bases. And Ian's instant kind of like, not even like, you didn't do it to be funny. Like within two minutes, you were like, yeah. hey, I think you should probably get a, a Rick and back. <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's true though you should it is true it is true it is true and there is pro and probably you got to sell some stuff too i know dude i'm a pusher it's awful and i have these binge purge phases too where i get a bunch of stuff to try it out and then i'm like oh okay okay i gotta let some of this go but i find that i let go of a lot less than i pull in <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah oh man um, um, what what's on your list in the are fourth we talking up was that your fourth one two three oh that was your third so you've got precision with flats precision with rounds yeah short scale hollow body yep and a modern active five yeah i went jazz bass precision yep. bass modern active five yep fretless Ooh, fretless is in your four spot or is that a five spot that's in my fourth that's in your four spot Fourth spot, fretless, fretless is in your four. Are you serious? Yeah. Fretless is in yeah. your four spot. Yeah. <laughs> I love this choice. I and, and dude, these lists are, oh, I love, I love this list. 
Tell me why. I was just about to say, everybody, Scott's list is the one you should listen to. Don't listen to mine. <laughs> I'm you not sure about that, dude. But I'm then sure. you hit fretless, and I went, ooh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just love it's in there because I love fretless. Yeah, dude. Yes. I love fretless. And yep. can you imagine doing a track and they're like, oh, you know, can we have sort of like some something melodic, you know, up high maybe on the bass here? And you're like, and they're like, oh, like a fretless thing maybe? And you're like, yeah, oh. baby. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> absolutely. You fretless. Yeah, like that track I was playing you early on, yep. the, on the fretless. Oh, yes. they just sound beautiful. I love I- them. Again, mm-hmm. another another like iconic sound, and you can't get it on any other thing. I mean, no. you can kind of put a chorus pedal on, play on your Ken Smith, and, yeah. you know, turn the treble down, and maybe some somebody's gonna be like, "Oh, is that fretless?" Yeah. Because I feel like you know the fretless thing in the '80s with Pino was like bridge pickup. It was a Stingray chorus on it, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think you know you can do do sort of the poor man's version of a fretless sound with a bit of chorus, treble dialed back, and uh, bridge pickup. Yeah, but. Yeah. Ain't nothing gonna give you that. Mwah. Oh, it just sounds great. Oh, it sounds it great. great, and I think that everybody out there should just experiment with getting a fretless. I think Agreed. that, like, for whatever reason, I think that people are really intimidated by them, and I think that, and maybe because it's all that you know, all of that shit that people used to say. Oh yeah, play them in the dark, or you know, all of that. You know, great. You know, play it in the dark. It's fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. but it, it's, it ain't gonna help you, in my opinion, playing uh, playing tune. So yes. um, I just think that you know, even if you're just sort of like a year or so into playing the bass, man, having a fretless is just such a great way to uh, experiment with the bass in a different way and. And the more you get into it, the more you can do with it as well in terms of the notes and how you can. And I actually watched a video of me my, myself playing the other day, uh, the same track on two different bases, and mm. it was pretty wild. One of one of them was a fretless, and one of them was a fretted. Yep. On the fretted, I played as you would imagine. Um, you know, my right hand, my plucking hand was pretty much in the same place for all the way through the track. Right. Yes. On the fretless my right hand was moving all over the place. At some points I was right over the neck, plucking those big plummy kind of notes and making those notes bloom. Other times I'm right back by the bridge and everywhere in between. And I think that there's, from a dynamic uh, point of view or a dynamic perspective, there's something about the fretless bass that is, you can get more expression with it from the actual note itself. And I really love that. And I think that all bass players should experience that, even if you're just starting out. And just to put it out there as well, one note about playing in tune, it's actually more to do with your technique mm. than, you know, than anything else when it comes to playing in tune. Yes. If, you're, if your technique is good, meaning your left hand technique, you're, you're not doing anything weird, like holding the, the, uh, the neck like a baseball bat or anything like that. Yep. If you've got sort of like nice left hand technique, you're going to be 95% there, right? I so agree. It's, yeah. Yep. And if I don't you think it's as hard as yeah, people exactly. think it is. It's not yeah. as hard, no. And if you haven't got great hand left, hand left hand technique, what the fretless will do will be a nice forcing function to get that together mm-hmm. so you can play it too. Yeah. Fretless, Dude. man, number four. Check this out. I have I I wounded myself because there was a time, Scott, where I had a fretless that I absolutely loved. It was made by Joe Zahn of Zahn oh, Basses. Oh yeah, the Zahn Basses. Yeah, and it was a five string Sonus fretless, and it was incredible. And it had an RMC piezo bridge. Oh yeah. So yeah. it sounded kind of like acoustic-y. And it had this incredible long envelope to the low notes. Like you'd play a low C on it and it would be like, I mean, it was just (laughs) unreal, dude. And I would bring that into, and I used it on sessions. And there were a couple of producers that I worked with that were like, that is the cool, like bring that to every session. And I know you had a period where you played only fretless. I only and I, owned it one yeah. fretless. Yeah. Just, I that was my only bass. did too. Yeah. Really? Yeah, wow. yeah. There was a time period where I played that all the time. And then it went out of fashion. The fretless yeah. kind of went out of fashion. I'm studio guy. It's kind of a goofy color. It was Caribbean blue. So it was sort of this like <laughs> teal, <laughs> you know, like late nineties vibes. Yeah, and yeah, I yeah. was like, you know what? I'm not going to play this again. And I sold it. I sold it on oh, talk base for like nothing because they, I feel like you couldn't even give them away. I feel like yeah. I sold it for like $1,100 or something. And I yeah. 
that is one that I regret selling. So I am like, and then ever since then, I'm like, oh, if I could only find a fretless that kind of did that thing like that bass. And I've never, I have a cool Ibanez fretless from the eighties that I really like and play on stuff, but it's not. Yeah. I did the Jocko video for SBL on it and the Bakiti Kumalo video. Oh, yeah, that, you know, that is a really nice bass, actually. It's a That's killer. Weird. It's yeah. a killer, but it doesn't... Oh, dude, that Zahn, it was just like a... It sounded like a synthesizer. It sounded like a Moog by itself. It was just like... Yeah. I mean, God. Oh, <laughs> so I just... So I feel like it's not on my list because because I have trauma around, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I got rid of it and I'm, and I'm like, well, if I can't have a fret list, then, you know, like it shouldn't be on the list, but God damn it, dude. Oh man. It's good that it's on your list. I like it. Is that your fifth spot? Fret list? No, that was my fourth. That was, I've oh. got jazz bass, precision bass, modern five, then fret list. You've got precision, precision, short scale, hollow body and modern active five. Yeah. What's your final, what's your final bass, Ian? I'm hitting you with something. From left field, everybody. Left field because it's fun. Every single bass player needs to spend time with a bass six. Not bass a six string six. bass. Yes. Ooh. A Fender or, you know, there's a few other brands doing it. A bass six. And a bass six is a guitar that is tuned down an octave. So it's E to E, E, A, D, G, B, E, just like a guitar, but down an octave. And the reason you need to do it is it puts you in this completely other mindset. You're learning chord shapes that are guitar shapes. You're you're thinking about the instrument um, more in the context of like playing with a pick, I think. And yeah. so it, like the fretless on Scott's list, it is this forcing function to branch you out. And am I playing that on tons of gigs? No, but am I playing it on almost every single thing that I do in the studio? Yes. I you do, don't parts you? Parts on it, I do. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing. It can sound like a bass, but it can also sort of sound like a baritone guitar, and it's incredible. Um, yeah. I think, and get the Squire one, and it's cheap. You can get them for probably you know four to five hundred bucks used, and they are just this peek into a completely new world. Originally used in Nashville. Oh, dude. Dude, Glenn Campbell. I am a lineman oh. for the county. Oh, I love this song so much. And I drive the main road. This is, so some, good, old, this is, this is some old guy shit right here, dude. Yeah. <laughs> where, where, where's the uh, the bass six solo? The bass in solo, it? The, yeah. So Glenn plays uh, like a bass six solo on this tune, and it's maybe after chorus two. You know, it's Let's like see. where the bridge would be. That's it. Oh my word. What a sound. Ugh. And I need you. My I mean, word. what, so what good, has happened it? for me with that instrument? is that I'll like play on something for someone, you know, someone will send me a song to play on and I'll do it. And then I'll hear an additional layer of production, like a, like a lead line or in the bridge, something that is maybe not bass, but maybe almost like guitar register. And I yeah. break that instrument out and I track it and send it to him. And always it is, it like surprises and delights. Really so I guess, wow. yeah, it's like, it's this extra little, you know, tool in your quiver where you're like, Oh, Base six would be really cool on this, and it is incredible. So, and do they use that with the base part you sent over? And they'll and they'll have the base six in there yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. So, definitely, I, I guess that what you're doing is introducing something that they've probably never even thought of. Exactly. Yeah, yes. it's kind of this sort of like secret weapon. <laughs> it is, and, and they're you know, and I mean, I have a fancy like custom shop one from Fender that I really like, but the one that we gave away. Uh, for Winnebase Build a School was, it was a Squire school, that, I, you know, that I just bought in a box. I mean, I hadn't even, like, I played one, and then they said, oh, we've got a new one in the box. Do you just want that? I'm like, sure, great. And I busted it out to do all the content for Winnebase, but it's awesome. They're so yeah. good, and they just, like I say, they bring you into this new space where then you kind of also then know how a Jaguar or Jazz Master, like an offset Fender guitar feels and sounds. Yeah. They come with a whammy bar. 
So you yeah. go, bow yeah. down, down, and it's like, oh, this is different, yeah. right? It just, ooh, I'm just saying, man, like it's, to me, it has been the most useful instrument in bass family that I hadn't thought of before. And they're you know, tuned when I got E it. to E, right? Like a guitar, E-D. but just an octave down. Yes. So you've got that B string that's kind of like out of whack. You do. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But learning a little bit about, um, about what's the uh, caged method, C A G E D, the caged yeah, shapes yeah. where you know how to play those guitar shapes. It's great. It's incredible. But you can just play the first four strings and forget about the upper two, too. <laughs> it just leans you in this yeah, direction yeah. sonically where you want to play kind of like plunky um, or kind of like riffy. I've used it on like riffy stuff that sounds like the Black Keys or Jack White or something. Oh, yeah, it's just, yeah. but it feels like a pick instrument. And that to me is just wow how fun yeah i yeah. love it so that's your five dude you've got precision with flats precision with rounds <laughs> short scale hollow body modern active five and a bass six not a jazz bass in sight <laughs> my word your favorite your favorite bass is on there <laughs> i know i just i was i was trying to think about the royal we scott i was trying to think about the you know the editorial yeah. the royal you know the the <laughs> Bass community incarnate, and yeah. but my sixth choice is a jazz bass. <laughs> <laughs> my five is jazz bass, precision bass, modern active five, fretless, something weird. That was my five. That's your fifth. Your fifth yeah. is something, yeah, something okay, weird. So that yep. would be a hollow body short scale. Oh, see, but this isn't fair. This isn't like fair. <laughs> Dude, I want you to commit. I want you to commit. No fair. Oh. You can't have the weird spot. I want, of all of those things, what short is... Scale, short scale, hollow body. If I had to pick, short scale, hollow body. Because I know that they're just really useful in the studio. They really are. Yeah. And that, But that's something that you don't have. That's something that we're going to have to solve, Scott. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> dude you you earlier you mentioned you're fretless you were like oh yeah. that is like one of the bases that i wish oh, i'd never God sold damn it. one of them that got away what what's the base that got away is there one and you're like ah oh, i should never have let that go i sold my billy sheehan attitude that my grandmother bought me like or that she helped me buy yeah. um that was like my first real base I just really didn't like playing that. And even when I got it, I knew it was nice and I knew it was awesome, but I really always struggled to play that thing. And I ended up selling it, but I, I regret that. But the one that got away for me it, for sure, 100% is that fretless. It's the one that got away. Awesome. I should not have sold that instrument. It was so like signature to what I was doing at the time. And, and now I feel like if I just like owned it and played it back when I sold it, I was like, Oh, it, it doesn't look the right, like the right thing for the gig, you know, and people are yeah. going to tease me that it's translucent teal or whatever. Now I'm like, give me translucent teal all day long, dude. <laughs> oh, it's such an idiot. Yeah, and I even I tried, like I found the guy that I sold it to, and then he sold it to someone in China and that shit <sighs> is gone. Yeah. It is yeah. gone. You never know, it, man. It might come back. Like I've maybe there's some I love watching bases like bounce around the world. There, there was this uh this base I was looking at and it was over in there's two bases actually I've seen do this. This one was over in the Philippines, I think. Or Thailand maybe. And and then I saw it crop up on reverb like five months later. Amazing. It in, yeah. It was in Dallas. I was like, oh, it's in Dallas. Crazy. And yes. now it's moving on somewhere else. You know, it'll be maybe it's, well, maybe it's in the UK or whatever. You know, yeah. sort of like the bases travel around. As you said the other week, you were like, we're just, you know, what, how did you, what, what term did you use? Dude, we are just stewards. We are stewards of the base. Mm, yeah. Temporarily. These bases will pass through and they will live on without us that is so cool it's true that yeah. said if you've got my if you've got my zon sonus active five string two bartolini soaps piezo bridge fretless let me buy you it would from love you it back. yeah if it's in your back. closet let your boy buy it back from you <laughs> how about you you have one that got away no, the one that the one that got away was the one that I didn't buy. That I, I played in a shop, and I was like, "This is the most incredible jazz bass I've ever played. I want it." And the guy's like, "We sold it." Like, and he was like, "It was either like this afternoon, or I think it was this afternoon. We, we sold it this afternoon over the phone. late seventies. 
natural body. I can't remember whether it was late seventies. It was. It was definitely not desirable. It wasn't one of the desirable ones, and yep. it looked like a dog. I can remember. Right. Yeah, it was one of those great moments in time where you look at the website and you're like, "Whoa, all of these bases are going to be amazing," and then you play them all and you're like, "Meh." But then you play one that didn't jump out to you on, on the yes. website. You're like, well, I'm just going to leave that one, whatever. And then you randomly end up playing it. And you're like, holy <gasps> crap, this is the base. Yes, that's yeah. the base. That was the one that, that, that got away. I've had some great bases, though. I've had some great bases. Like some of the bases that Federa, Matt Garrison that I had. Oh, yeah. That yep. was cool. That I we gave to away. Play that. I would it love was, to that. That was cool. That. I had this like Anthony Jackson kind of like signature federa you did one, one the, pickup the six string with a holly top yes you had that yeah we gave it away holy crap yeah Crazy. that's the only one actually that lisa has ever mentioned really? i got it out the case <laughs> and her first words were please tell me you're not giving that away and i like looked us straight in the face i was like we're giving it away <laughs> amazing dude yeah it had an oak neck a oh, red cool. oak neck. That was pretty cool, actually. So cool. The one yeah. for me from you, too, was that um, that recent BN5, the F-Base, the sort of like bursty, oh, that was, yeah, burst. ready blue. That was beautiful, yeah. That, that thick string, that Ken Smith oh, that you yep. played, that was really yep. nice. That was really That's nice. That's a great bass. Yeah, great bass. Huge. <laughs> giant. Huge. Just like <laughs> yes. giant. I, I love those Smith basses, man. Yeah. I love them. Yeah. I know they're like, so cool. Yeah. They're so weird. Like, I mean, like in terms of the sound as well. Like, it's something that, and some people really don't like that tone as well. They, like, you know, yep. you'll go onto forums and you'll say, hey, if you're into the Smith sound, you're into it. If you're not, you're not. It's like a Marmite type of experience. <laughs> Marmite, For me, yeah. like when I play it just through cans, I was playing it yesterday, I think, just through cans. No, like playing it with no, no track. Amp. And I was yeah. just like, oh, this sounds so weird. Yeah. Like that, that G string, it just it mm. sounds so bell like that weird piggy. Yeah. But just in the track it sounds killer. I know. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I mean, that's so cool. Like an instrument that has a thing that is not trying to satisfy everybody, right? Yeah. That's not trying to be all the things. That yeah. it's just like, nope, this is our thing. This is what we're going to do. Those are sort of the things that I feel like emerge as the, the pillars. You know, of like, man, because there's a lot of stuff. Like, I remember, like, Lakeland making the 5502 or the 5594, yeah, which yeah. kind of supposed to be a music man and a fender and all these things together. A nice workhorse, but boy, just sort of, like, not necessarily a personality of its own. And yeah, there's something yeah. about, like, a Smith or maybe an MTD or a Spectre or something that just has, like, a very, like, ah, yep, you hear it and you're like, yeah, that's a... That's a thing, man. That is yeah, a thing, like the for specs, sure. When you were playing that the other week, like that's a real it's, deal, right? It's yeah. like that 90s rock thing, man. Yeah. It's the well, sound we were, that I grew like up loving. Alice in Chains, yeah. dude. Alice yeah. in Chains. Yep, yeah. for sure. I mean, yeah. I love that stuff. I love it forever. Oh, good times, dude. <laughs> hey, you you now need to you need to take a snooze and dream of your short scale hollow body. <laughs> oh, dude, I'm, I'm actually, yeah, I need a, I need a hollow body. I, I am kind of secretly dreaming about Ken Smith at the minute. I'm just, you know, oh, we yeah, were talking yeah, about earlier. Yes. Yeah. Like I'm dreaming about Ken Smith. I really want to try yeah, for the record, try out a five for that record. Yeah. Like, yep. and I've been using my, my F base, my banana base. I absolutely love the banana base. The banana and, base. And, but, yes. and I actually like, like if I'm going to a desert island, I'm actually not taking. I'm taking the banana bass over the Ken Smith four, right? Because that bass just sounds got this real fend. Like the F bass has just got a yes. real fendery texture to the sound. I freaking love it. But just in the mix on that that those, those tracks that I've been doing for that project, it, yeah, it just doesn't cut in the same way, right? It's because right. it has because it's because the 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 tone is just more mellow. You know, it's just it's right. interesting. God damn. It's oh, just a rabbit hole, isn't it? It's, it's like endless. A, an endless rabbit hole, yeah. It's, and it's absolutely a, endless. It's great, isn't it? I actually used yeah. to fight against it when I was a kid. When I was like in my early 20s, I can remember a friend of mine 
great friend called Jeff. We used to sort of like nerd out on this and there'd be sort of like, it'd be fun talking about it, but we were both like kind of annoyed about it at the same time. <laughs> oh, I just want a bass. I just want the ultimate bass tone. Like I don't want to mess around anymore, right? And in later years, I've actually really come to like the the kind of the the just ambiguity of I know, yeah, yeah, of trying to find that perfect tone and and and, and being at one with the the reality that there is no perfect tone, and it's exactly. actually. And it, you, I think that you mentioned this a few weeks ago. It's actually there's no bass that has the perfect tone. No. It's finding the right bass for the track. That's yep. the that's the key. Absolutely. And I think that yeah, just so yeah. interesting. And I think too, it's like um, you know, you can think about it that way, right? The right bass for the track. But then you've said something that has really resonated with me. Of like, you know, it's time spent and like dedication to a certain for sound. Sure. Yeah, for sure. Because yeah. like you know, sometimes you can take the opposite approach. So there's my approach of like, oh, find the right base for the track. But then there's this opposite approach of like, do your thing. And that yes. might actually be a really interesting sound on a track. Like the guys that come up for me are Bubby Lewis and Boom Bishop. Like thinking about Boom Bishop's playing with like a six string active thing with nylon tapes. Yeah. And yeah. Bob and Bubby does this too of like, that's a sound that I never would have thought of. And like nylon tapes on like a modern six. No, that's supposed to be a sixties hollow body thing. Yeah. But then suddenly this new sound that is almost like this organic synth based sound on these tracks. It's just it's like, so whoa, good. well, both, both of them are so good. Like, so like, good. Like, yeah. That boom Bishop, um, who was he playing with? Was it something? Uh, was it Layla Hathaway? Wasn't it with glass or keys? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's Layla it's like, Hathaway. He did the thing that's with, right. Yeah, but that track where yep. I was like, we were knocking it back and forth between. We were yep. like, how is he doing that? Yeah, but it was yeah, it was incredible. Yeah, to me, I just thought it was like a lot of bass boost and nylon tape strings on yeah. his like active six string bass, and like man, I never would have thought to have done something like that. So. You know, yes, there are these like best practices of like here are the base here are the bases that everybody needs. You know, get what, what, five of, and then you're going to be fine. But also, also the end of the pod, if you're if you're chasing a sound, chase it down dead, chase it down dead. And if it's not the thing that everybody else is doing, that might actually be a plus, right? Oh, for sure, yeah. might be a plus. Yeah, so sure. you know, follow the follow the bliss, follow the love, follow your aesthetic, um, but then also just know that that might not be the right thing. You know, you're booked on a thing, and someone's like, "Hey, can you just play an active five string, please?" <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, "Wait, you're not loving this like Glenn Campbell like plunky bass six vibe? What are you talking about? You know, like you have to have the emotional intelligence or P to, bass to right? know." Yeah, or, or P-Base. P-Base, you know, yeah, like, right. like we've talked about it before, like I was recording in London, I can't remember what the studio was, but I was down in London doing a session and um, and I'd taken my fancy ass, you know, active five strings, <laughs> yeah, yeah, spalted yeah. maple top. Oh, of, oh like, so spalted, dude. Yeah, so spalted. <laughs> so spalted. <laughs> the spalt the engineer was, was like, intense. Huh. Yeah. And he just like gave me this sort of like picked up the, this bass off the wall, which is this like crummy P bass. There wasn't even a P bass, I think. I think it was just sort of like some copy. And he yeah. was like, can, can, can you try this on the track? And I was like, yeah, I suppose. And then I like, played it. I was like, damn. <laughs> it was the way. That's it. That was the way. This is the way, dude. This is the way. <gasps> Mandalorian. Dude, dude, check Days it out. Days away. Well, well, no, the, it just came out yesterday. The new episode just came out oh, yesterday. Oh, it's yeah. out yesterday. It's out, yep. Oh. And we're doing a watch party tonight with my mom's coming over, dude. <laughs> we're going to hang out. Oh, we're going to, it's, it's Mando Thursday nights at the Allison household. So we're going to, we're going to rock it Are tonight. they rolling it out epi an episode per week? Yes, sir. Oh, Not, those You dicks. can't binge it. I know. That's oh. how they do. That's how they do. Yeah. Oh, how dare they? binge it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so rough. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Story's been goes. waiting for it coming out, man. He's he's yeah, like super it's ready. about it. I've just been trying to keep my eyes off the internet because, you know, I'm a day late to it and I follow all that crap. So there's spoilers abound. Yeah, but there is, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. isn't it cool when your kids get to the get to that age where you can like enjoy like cool cool tv oh, shows with them the and best. Two cool films and stuff we've yeah. just been doing like a harry potter like marathon oh. over the last few uh last so few fun. weeks we yes. do we're going to see avatar 2 on saturday oh, like it's sick. awesome and i just can't wait to like every time like lisa's like oh i don't want the kids to get any older i'm like 
I get it. And I'm right there with her because story turned 10 in like a few days yeah, ago. Yeah, I know, right. Uh, but at the same time, but, but Lisa, like, what about that first time where we watched like Alien with them? Like, how cool! <laughs> yeah, or, like, right, Terminator, right. Terminator, or like yes. all of these classic films that are yep. freaking awesome. Yeah, yeah dude, so I know. I'm taking Everly to an anime convention. It's called Anna Minneapolis <laughs> because she's all into <laughs> Demon Slayer Amazing. and, you know, and like Death yeah. Note and and uh, attack on titan all these like classic animes now and so we're Was i'm Demon leaning into Slayer it man. the one that you were telling me that i have Dude, to yes. watch it's a yes it's a must watch it just because it, it is i mean even just from the perspective of cultural awareness it's the biggest anime that has ever been it's japanese largest grossing franchise of all time that that's incredible crazy. bigger than anything ever that has ever been in japanese cinema ever crazy but so that's cool when you said that like the largest grosser of all time is that of all time captive to japan yes yes just okay, japan got it okay yeah. okay yeah so it's not like blowing star wars out of the way <laughs> well but in japan it is in japan it is wow yeah god. Yeah. yeah bigger than anything ever that has ever been on screen in japan it that's beat wild it. yeah dude let's call it yeah <laughs> i need to go lie down <laughs> go lie down man such a treat and uh everybody thank you for listening if this podcast brings you value you got to hit us up with that rating give us those five stars if you feel like yes. ah, it's a little less than five stars just keep that rating to yourself just keep that inside <laughs> <laughs> oh thanks guys take it easy we'll see you next time i will be back with no back pain take it easy bye <laughs> take care everybody